You go, Simon. Okay, well, good afternoon, good evening, everybody. Um, this is SETI Live. My name is Simon Steele. I'm the Director of Education and Outreach at the SETI Institute. And uh, today I'm talking to geophysicist uh, Mika McKinnon. Um, and the subject here is a paper that's just come out uh, with, you know, when you're thinking of silver linings for a pandemic, you have to have to dig deep. Um, but but there's a possibility, you know, here that that there is something that is useful happening when humans tend to, to be quiet and stay at home. So so we're going to look at a paper that's just been published in in science, and uh, Mika's going to tell us all about that. But before we start, Mika, uh, this isn't your day job, is it? I just maybe just say a little bit about uh, your work at the SETI Institute, which is slightly less down to earth. Yes, so with the SETI Institute, I'm working with Project Espresso, which is this idea of we're sending all of these spacecraft and robots to asteroids and comets. And when they get there, they go in orbit, and then hopefully some of them do little landers or rock collection asteroid sample return missions. Uh, but when they're doing that, we want to make sure that they're, they're targeting somewhere that's both interesting and safe, find that overlap, land in the middle. So what I'm doing is I'm part of the team where is safe, looking at landslides on asteroids. So I used to look at landslides on Earth, try and understand how really big landslides work because they, they move faster and farther than they really should by like basic physics. Uh, there's all sorts of weird, cool, complicated things going on for a rock falling downhill where you're like, how is this so much more fun than I would have expected? When you take away atmosphere and you have variable gravity and you add on some spin, things get really complicated. So we're trying to figure that out. Uh, so that's my primary research project. Okay. So, 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 so we're basically into disasters is what you're talking about. And, oh, uh, yes. and certainly if anyone does have any questions um, about Mika, either about asteroids and, and asteroid slides, um, <laughs> that will be great. If you have any questions about the, the work that we're about to talk about, that is great too. Also, let us know where you're listening from. Uh, we usually have a global audience. It'd be fun to hear where people are, are signing in from on Facebook. And then if you do have any questions, just type them in. And uh, Rebecca, the, the, the somebody in the background here is going to send on those questions and we'll pass them on to Mika um, to, to ask those. So uh, please do think about any questions and send them in. Uh, so just to start, this, this is the paper and I'm going to read the title, um, Global Quietening of High Frequency Seismic Noise Due to COVID-19 Pandemic Lockdown Measures. So um, before, before we actually di dissect that title, this, this was an article that had 76 authors from 66 institutions and 27 countries. And yeah. so my, my question, first of all, is how <laughs> did you get involved? So this is um, the core concept of the paper comes from Thomas Lecoq, who's at, in Belgium. Uh, and geophysicists are, are incurable gossips. Um, the, the concept of geophysics is that we want to know all of the Earth's subsurface secrets. And we do this by doing something that creates a signal and then seeing what the result is. So we're just constantly provoking the planet and being like, ha ha, I will shock you with electricity. What happened? Or, whoa, earthquake, yes. And have those seismic waves go through and then use how those seismic waves change to understand what the inside of the Earth looks like. What this means is that we're constantly seeing these weird signals that we don't quite know how to interpret, and we're constantly sharing and talking about them. Uh, we do this a lot on Twitter. Geoscience Twitter, particularly geophysics Twitter, on is like a very active, very vocal community where anytime something unusual happens, we're all sharing our seismic signals being like, this is what I saw at my station. Did you, did you pick it up? Is this real? Is it local? Is it like, do I have an instrument malfunction or is there something that just happened? Uh, so what we, we started gossiping about was all of our seismic stations started getting quieter, uh, like a lot quieter. And normally we're seeing things where people are, like when people commute in the morning, the traffic noise of their cars driving to work creates vibrations in the ground, which is picked up by our seismic stations. Um, and then they all go sit in offices for a day 
And then they come out for lunch and we see a spike of all that pedestrian traffic now walking around and all those footfalls on the ground making vibrations. And we pick all of that up. So we started seeing things get quieter and we started going, hey, my seismic station is quiet, it's yours. And another person would chime in and go, yeah, here's mine. Oh, look at this, it's getting even quieter as the pandemic goes on. Um, and Thomas wrote some code for us where we could pull it out and start comparing all of our stations together and start quantifying that. So he's our ringleader. Um, and then everybody joined in with their various seismic stations from around the world um, and their interpretation of what was going on with their local country's public health policies because we had different timing of what happened when. So it's this big, huge collaboration that started on Twitter. Right. So I always Social imagine, you know, <laughs> well, you know, you're, you're sitting, I grew up on a, a very busy road. And of course, every time these trucks go past and planes were flying over as well, everything was rattling. And, and obviously, that's not the place I would want to put a seismograph to measure the vibrations or potential earthquakes. So uh, you're saying that there are, you know, tell us a little bit about these seismographs or these detectors um, that, that you're using one for you. Okay. I have one right here. And while Mika is uh, grabbing the previously prepared uh, seismograph, uh, let me say that people are listening in from Phoenix, um, Bolivar, Ohio, Humboldt County, uh, Oregon, Belgium, Flanders, Germany, Norway, and Southern Illinois. So welcome everybody from, from uh, Europe and, and the US at the moment. Fantastic. Uh, so normally we put our seismic stations in isolated remote places because we want to minimize how much noise we're getting. So we built a global seismic network originally in order to do things like monitor for underground nuclear test blasts, because if you can hide an explosion from being seen from up above, but that energy is still going to slam into the rock, cause the rocks to vibrate and wiggle, and those seismic signals propagate out and you can't hide it. There's nothing you can do to mask a nuclear bomb test underground. So that's what the, like, the original reason we started at Global Seismic Network was part of this anti-nuclear proliferation monitoring. Uh, but once we had the network, we realized we were also picking up earthquakes all of the time. Uh, and from that, we're able to start using it for monitoring for disasters, for understanding earthquakes, for then all of these other things, like accidentally getting traffic noise or shipping traffic or everything else. Mm -hmm. But our original seismic network is supposed to be isolated as remote as we can get and usually near tectonic boundaries plates where the plates are tectonic plates of the earth are moving side to side like san andreas fault in san francisco mm -hmm. or they're pulling apart like the mid-atlantic ridge or they're coming together i'm up in the pacific northwest in vancouver bc when they come together one plate going under another you also get earthquakes but there's something really really cool that's going on in the last couple of years which is um this proliferation of small scale, relatively inexpensive, cheap seismometers. So this is a little, the, this is the actual geophone, the thing that detects vibrations up, down, side to side, all of that. It's kind of like a three dimensional microphone, except for tuned to different frequencies. So it's not for audio noise, it's for seismic waves. Um, and these are all over the place. They're in schools, they're in museums, they're personally owned, and people are operating these seismic stations in like their backyard and just plug them in and they're uploading data. So it's a, it's a Raspberry Shake is what it is because uh, it uses a Raspberry Pi microprocessor on, in it. And those tend to be places where there are people. So for example, there's one in Vancouver, right in the center of downtown, next to our major convention center and next to our cruise um, port place where all the cruise ships come in. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So when lockdown started, the convention stopped and people stopped coming downtown for commuting because they were all working from home. The construction slowed down and the, like, the cruise ship stopped coming in. Suddenly that seismic station went from really, really loud to much, much, much quieter. Mm -hmm. And same with the ones in downtown London, the same with the ones in Seattle. We've got one in, um, there's several in the San Francisco Bay Area. They're just constantly propagating this data and we can see noise, 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 noise. Pandemic lockdown, public health policy suddenly gets quieter, mm -hmm. stays quiet. And then as those public health policies start loosening up, as there's reopening starting, that noise slowly starting to ramp back up again. Mm -hmm. 
Now, it's a, before I have the question to ask you, but uh, just to say that we got uh, tons more people listening in from uh, Glasgow, uh, Denmark, the UK, Israel, New Zealand, North Carolina, yeah. Pennsylvania, New Jersey, almost as many places as you have, um, you know, um, raspberry shakes, I think. Uh, LA, Montreal, uh, San, San, Fernando, San Fernando Valley, I'll get that right in a second. Uh, New York and, and Seville in Spain. So welcome everybody. So, so you've got these, these um, devices set up uh, in very, very noisy places in, in mm -hmm. human terms. Um, and then suddenly like, uh, you know, one of these sort of science fiction movies, everything goes quiet. What, what are you picking up? What, what are you picking up that you couldn't pick up because there was a party next door? <laughs> so, there's there's two different pieces of this story well three different pieces one is are we sure what we're seeing is how we're interpreting it right like we're seeing it quiet how do we know it's because there's less physical activity going on that's a good theory but can we actually back it up if we're just seeing it in seismic signals so there's that part of the story which is a very cool thing to go down the next part of the story is uh what does it mean and the third is what are the consequences and the consequences are because it's so much quieter we think we might be able to pick up fainter earthquakes. And we're not sure yet because that, that data still needs to be processed. But effectively, we have this accidental global experiment going on. Another group of researchers is calling it the anthropause, the, the timeout for human activity. And during the anthropause, we're seeing things like uh, various greenhouse gases are being produced less vigorously. Um, we're seeing things be more seismically quiet. There's less marine noise. And from that, we're maybe able to see a little bit more of the non-human generated noise in this world. So things like here in British Columbia, um, the whale researchers are able to hear whale song from farther away because the port traffic is quieter. Mm -hmm. uh, we are hoping we might see fainter earthquakes. So there are hundreds and hundreds of earthquakes all of the time. Mm -hmm. um, and normally uh, we detect maybe like a magnitude three earthquake if it happens right under you, feels a bit like maybe a truck slammed into your house or maybe like a giant slammed their fist down on the roof. It's a very sudden sharp vibration and then it's done. Mm -hmm. Whereas something like a magnitude six earthquake is significant prolonged shaking over an entire city and a magnitude eight or nine would be significant prolonged shaking over an entire region. Mm -hmm. Well, we're hoping we might see more of the magnitude one and two earthquakes. Mm -hmm. So the stuff that's normally drowned out by all of this human noise. And if we can see those from that, we might, and don't know yet, but we might be able to see a few more fault lines. So um, one of the things that's dangerous about earthquakes is when we don't know exactly where they're going to happen. So 1994 Northridge earthquake in Los Angeles was a rupture on a fault line where we knew that whole region had the San Andreas fault somewhere in there ish, but the exact place that split and moved, we didn't know it was a fault. And so it split and moved and broke buildings that were like literally built across the weak point. Mm -hmm. So maybe fingers crossed, mm -hmm. if we see more of these faint earthquakes, we might be able to trace out a few more of these tiny little fault lines that we don't know about yet and map those out and understand them better. Okay. So Maybe. just uh, the uh, earthquake magnitudes are, are a logarithmic scale, aren't they? So when you talk yes. about uh, a magnitude two earthquake or one compared to a three, it doesn't sound like it's much less, but of course you're, you're yeah. talking about, um, you know, getting down a thousand times less energy, I presume. Exactly. When you get yeah, exactly. And it's much, much, much smaller. And it's something that can be, and you only get it over a very small area where that energy just goes, poof, and you don't notice it most of the time. Yeah. If you've got construction site activity, yeah. if you've got ships unloading, if you've got all of these other things, like there's some noises that are still happening right now. So waves crashing into a beach, those waves create enough energy into the rocks that they're compounding it on and you get those vibrations or when through um, either a forest or through a city either way that wind will blow the tree or the skyscraper make it sway back and forth and then the root of it the foundations of it will pull on the ground and create more vibrations so that sort of noise is still happening it's not like the entire world is completely silent 
but it's a lot quieter. Right. So earthquakes, you're really talking about, you know, we used to sound in air because that's how we communicate and there's music, there's, there's drumming, there, there's voices and everything. And, and earthquakes um, are, are sort of sound, you know, communication through, through rock. Um, how, how can you tell the difference between a, a, a human or an artificial sound at, in rock and a natural sound? What are the characteristics here? So this is this is the the piece of it. So how do we know how to interpret what we're seeing? Mm -hmm. There's some seismic signals that we pay a lot of attention to. So we know with an er when an earthquake happens, you have the initial P wave, the pressure wave, the primary wave, and this is um, it's like if you took a slinky and you squish both ends. I have a slinky somewhere else, but I won't go grab it right now. If you took a slinky and it you push along it, that <laughs> wave going back and forth, that's the pressure wave, and it shows up first. And then next you have the S waves, the shear waves, the secondary waves going back and forth. Uh, and then you have all of the surface waves, the love waves, the Rayleigh waves, the things that actually cause damage. And we know what all of those wave types look like. We've, we've spent a lot of time looking at them. Um, we are pretty good at identifying different types of explosions and blasts and how big that seismic noise is. It tends to, instead of being um, these re repeating waves, instead it's this huge burst of energy that happens all at once. Uh, something like a landslide with rocks breaking and then falling and hitting the ground is almost like the seismic equivalent of a <laughs> noise where it's this more drawn out collection of smaller seismic waves all piled on top of each other. Mm. Um, we are pretty good at seeing the rhythm of human activity because we've, we've now seen this human noise over and over and over again of it's got a day night cycle. It literally follows commuting patterns. Uh, we can stick a seismic station next to a train station and see what happens when a train comes in or see what happens when a seismic, uh, when I, um, a semi trailer goes past. But we wanted to be sure this quieting we were seeing was actually human activity getting quieter, which meant we looked at more than just seismic data. We started looking at what other data we could find. So we did things like we looked at um, phone data of where like Google and Apple released this anonymized data set saying, are people at home? Are they at work? Are they traveling? Um, and the places we were seeing quiet were places where people were staying home more according to their data. But that's not enough. That's just, this still trusting that the cell phones are giving us good information. So we also did things like looked at um, airport flight logs. So there's a really neat set of examples from the Bahamas where this is their peak tourist season at the start of lockdown. And we had this huge Russian seismic noise when the pandemic was a known thing. We knew it was happening. As everybody left to get home, so all the tourists evacuating out, and there's this burst of noise of all more planes taking off. And then it drops down much, much quieter as we have fewer people and way fewer flights. And we can see in the flight logs that this, like, it exactly matches up. Mm -hmm. um, in the, the London example, there's some environmental microphones, like normal audio microphones that are measuring what is the amount of noise that's happening, like what sort of noises are there in the environment. And there's some that are set up next to traffic, literally to measure the, the audible noise of cars going past every day. And our seismic quieting directly matched up with its traffic noise decrease. So they both went quieter at the same time. So we're seeing all these other pieces of data pile on top of each other and go, yep, it matches, it matches, it matches, it matches, it matches. Good. That's yeah. good. That's really good science when it, it when it when it all ties together under this. Uh... Oh, yeah. <laughs> and what this means is that now in the future, we're going to have a better idea of what this human generated anthropogenic noise looks like. Mm -hmm. So this is an accidental experiment where we can we we thought we were pretty sure all of this mm -hmm. was human generated noise and we could safely filter it out while we were doing our looking for other things. Mm -hmm. But now we actually have with without here are the two things. <laughs> Hopefully, again, we don't know yet, but hopefully in the future, this will make it easier for us to identify human generated seismic noise. Yeah, yeah. And of course, you could you, you have to rely on something like a pandemic because you can't tell everyone. Can you just yeah. keep it down for 10 minutes? Yeah, exactly. Global uh, experiment. Can everyone just stay home yeah. for, I don't know, three weeks just because yeah. isn't going to work. So we have a, a couple of questions here. Actually, one that ties in with something I was thinking of. This is from um, Minor. Um, 
now that you've run the experiment, um, will you be able through algorithms to, to tune out uh, the human noise when everything starts up again because now you you in a sense you have you have the character of the sound and it would be nice if you could just now artificially uh, create a pandemic uh, and listen to what's behind it <laughs> yeah we really 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 hope so so we think so in theory it should work out um we'll we'll have to see what happens as things get noisy again uh so that's definitely we hope that this will give us a better understanding of the characteristics of human generated seismic noise and we hope that makes it easier in the future to be able to filter that noise out uh one of the really interesting things about working with seismic data is that you you can't um look at just one piece of it it's like how when you're listening with your ears to something, you hear all the noises simultaneously and you have to be able to filter out, this is the sound of human voice, ignore the background music. Uh, and that can be much more challenging if you're a loud, noisy environment. Um, well, hopefully this is helping us so we can do things like have filters on that and be able to pull it out more. So mm -hmm. in theory, it will work. Um, it might take a while to get from theory to practice, uh, but hopefully in the future, this will make it much easier for us to be able to, to separate out those different seismic signals and go, these ones are human. Mm -hmm. These ones are everything else. Cool. Now, uh, somebody did mention, of course, we've all been, uh, you know, um, uh, shocked by the, the scenes from Beirut with, with the very large uh, warehouse explosion. Um, that must have been quite a... a, a in events, uh, it, mm -hmm. seismologically, uh, do, do you know, I mean, it's very, very recent. Do, do you know if that was recorded? Uh, yeah, the Beirut explosion definitely was picked up in by seismometers. It shows up as a sudden huge blast of energy. Um, it requires, a, I would not wish to interpret what exactly those pieces mean yet. Um, because with all of geophysics, you need to have ground truth and you need to be able to pull the pieces together and say, okay, there's this piece of data. How do I interpret it? It's a lot of geophysics is, um, it's actually a lot like Douglas Adams Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy. You have the answer and you need to figure out what the question was. Mm -hmm. So you have how the signal changed and you have infinite possibilities of what could have created that change. And you need all these contextual pieces to pick out what was the best question. What mm -hmm. was the, the most likely set of geology underneath, the most likely source energy, the most likely whatever, in order to get this end result. Mm -hmm. So with Beirut, we can see there was definitely a huge explosion uh, and it created a large seismic signal. And doing any more interpretation than that is going to be done carefully in conjunction with what people see on the ground and what other data there is. But we definitely saw it on the seismic stations and we saw it from quite far away. I have a question here from, from uh, Kuba. Uh, relating this work with, with the work of the SETI Institute, now this is, this is separate from your work at the SETI Institute. Um, nevertheless, th this, is a, this is a concept of, of interpreting signals, isn't it? Mm -hmm. Um, and maybe you could say a little bit about that, um, you know, and, and how a seis seismology builds up this three-dimensional picture of a planet. Yeah, so this is actually, I would say that there is, I mean, it sounds completely separate to talk about landslides on asteroids and to talk about seismic quieting during a pandemic. They sound completely unrelated, but they're both geophysics and they're both geophysics specifically related to understanding disasters and to understand how things can go wrong um, so we can better anticipate that if you can understand the science and the physics of a disaster, you have more options in what choices you make. And the earlier you make those choices, the more, um, the more flexibility you have in the decisions you make. We're really, really good at this with space flight. We think about this a lot. We do things like we plan out an entire hazard assessment for a landing ellipse on Mars, before we even launch a spacecraft. And we pick the launch time in order to have the lowest amount of risk when it lands like a year later. So we do a great job with these hazard assessments with our spacecraft, but we get kind of sloppy when it comes to humans here on earth. We get a little bit lazy sometimes about 
doing these trade-offs between, well, I have to do something that's a little less fun now um, because the disaster is not going to happen. And then you end up in situations like this where so many of our emergency resources right now are focused on the pandemic that we don't have very many materials and resources and time and energy left over for hurricane season mm -hmm. or for in California fire season um, that those are going to add on. And if we can maybe understand the disasters a bit better and forecast a bit better and predict a bit better, maybe we'll have more options. So they're, they are related that way, mm -hmm. but there's also just the geophysics of it. So the geophysics mm -hmm. is when I first like went to grad school as a geophysicist, I wasn't really sure what that meant. I had an undergraduate degree in physics and I wanted to work with rocks. I was like, this is the same thing, right? Like maybe, turns out uh, geophysics is looking at the physical characteristics of rocks and using that to try and understand mysteries. Like I, I described this as gossips and we really are because it's all about wanting to pull apart secrets. It's all about wanting to, to use those physical properties of materials to understand things you can't see, to understand what's happening beneath your feet where you can't go. Like we can't see inside of Mars. We can't like drill core to the center of Mars, but we've got a robot on Mars right now called the, the, the Insight Lander. And it's a geophysicist whose job is to sit there very, very, very quietly listening. And that's the job of the robot. It's got a little seismometer and it's listening for any impact anywhere on Mars. If there's a thermal contraction from the entire planet slowly cooling over time and it crunching down, that thermal contraction will create seismic signals that travel through the planet. And then we can hopefully pull that apart and understand things. If there is uh, like a little meteorite impact somewhere, it's like throwing a little pebble into a pond, creating ripples. And those ripples traveling out might tell us about the material properties of Mars. So it's just there very, very, very quiet listening. And then maybe we'll be able to take those signals and pull them apart and go, okay, so what needs to have happened to create this signal? Like if we know what the source looked like and we know what the end looks like, what had to happen in between? We do that here on earth with our seismic signals. We're trying to do it on Mars with like the InSight lander seismic signals. So first time on another planet. So there's a whole lot of unknowns with the, the lack of constraints there, but it's a very, very cool problem. Yeah. One of the questions actually that just came in was talking about um, uh, doing seismology on, on other planets. And and of course, we've now got three because uh, the moon, I think, has, has seismographs, uh, Mars does, and the Earth does. So now we have a sample of three planets where there's direct measurement um of of uh you know so you know in the interior of these worlds which is and pretty cool that are strange about them so one of the things i absolutely adore about the moon seismometer so it was brought there by astronauts who installed it and then did immediately what every single geophysicist who's ever installed a seismometer does stomp next to it in order to make sure it's working uh, and you can actually do this, your cell phone, if you've got a cell phone, uh, you can install a little seismographic app on it um, because they have 3D accelerometers. It has a teeny tiny little geophone um, because, and they installed them for positioning. So you know which way your, your phone is facing, but also, so if you drop your phone, it notices that sudden acceleration and it does shock protection inside of the device. Um, so your phone is actually a really good seismometer uh, and you can do this yourself of turn it on and then like stomp next to it and get the vibrations. But the very first seismic record from the moon has those stomps and I just, I feel a kinship with my <laughs> fellow geophysicists across time. Yeah, yeah. Um, we're coming coming up to talk, talking of time, um, and just a couple more people. We've got uh, some uh, people watching in from Oklahoma City, Mexico, Ireland, Rio. Um, so lots of lots of places. I have a question. Uh, you showed us your wonderful raspberry shake, um, and is it that's a reasonably cheap device? Is this mm -hmm. something that that uh, people can get involved with, citizen oh, yeah. science and things like that? Exactly. So this is uh, for anybody who's just tuning in now. This is a little raspberry shake. You can get them either DIY, so just the pieces and you assemble it yourself, or you can get them pre-assembled. This particular one is actually a shake plus boom. 
uh, which means that right here, I do infrasound monitoring as well, so I can see if there's air blasts. Um, so there's a couple different variations. Uh, this one was sent to me to review it, and I absolutely love it. They're on order of a few hundred dollars, um, and if you're doing a large number of them, so if you want to do uh, an entire school system or something like that, then they have their, own, you contact them and you can figure out the pricing on it and all that. But they're completely obtainable. Um, if you get them pre-assembled, they literally just require plug into power, plug into internet, boot up once, done. <laughs> and you're, you are providing citizen science, you're providing community data about the seismic signals of your location. Um, you can look and see there's the Raspberry Shake Network is a map of all the seismic stations of all of the Raspberry Shake seismic stations that are broadcasting all the time. So you can see that data, you can download that data and learn how to process seismic information. Um, again, I'm up in Canada. There's a, a teenager in Canada for their summer school project, like their homeschooling project while sheltered during pandemic was to download all of the seismic data from all of the Raspberry Shakes at all of the stations in Canada and do their own variation of this seismic quieting identification. So they use Thomas's code, they used a few hundred stations and they combine it together to explore it just because they could. Yeah, so that's really cool. It's, it's we'll very uh, accessible. We will put up some links to to uh, these Raspberry Shakes uh, on their website as well. You'll have a link to the the science paper and a little bit that that uh, um, we wrote about about the article and and what you've said about that, uh, Amika. So just to round off, um, where what next is is the? I mean, gradually, you know, fingers crossed, your experiment will come to an end very quickly because we all want to get out. <laughs> Yeah. But uh, what is how, how is this maybe brought up some ideas on how to move forward with the, these sort of yeah. experiments? So what I find really the most interesting and honestly reassuring about this research is that it is a way of seeing um, anonymized, fully bulk anonymized data sets. So completely secure. There is no way for me to pinpoint individual or, or de-anonymize it or anything like that. It's literally all the noise from an entire region of hundreds to thousands to millions of people stomping around simultaneously. Um, so fully anonymized data set that can be used to see how much physical activity is going on. So I can see whether or not people are commuting to work, if they are getting into a large gathering, like if some, if there's a concert going on with a few hundred people, that is really, really obvious on a seismometer, especially like we can see people dancing to the music and have that rhythm and the sway happening. It's, it's pretty funny with seismometers near concert venues of being able to like retroactively create the playlist if you know which singer was there of being like well why buy a ticket when you can listen to it in the comfort of your own home yeah <laughs> exactly um so we can see all of this which actually means we can see whether or not people are complying with public health decrees if there, there is lockdown happening we can see most people are staying home and there's actual quiet going on. Um, that as those public health guidelines loosen up, we can see more people going out. Um, and I find that really reassuring because sometimes like this is hard, right? This is, this is long and exhausting and hard and we're all getting burnt out. And sometimes it feels like you're the only one who's, who's making sacrifices for the public good that you're the only one who's trying and that you look outside your window and you see these groups of people wandering around and you're like, why? You're making this longer for all of us. And I get really frustrated. And then I look at my seismic data and go, no, actually it's still, we're still this percentage lower than normal activity. We're still following those guidelines even as it's ramping back up in British Columbia, we're now uh, supposed to be at roughly speaking uh, sixty percent of our normal physical contacts with each other, and our seismic noise is actually still, roughly speaking, sixty percent quieter than it usually is. So we're actually like I can quantify it and say we're doing good. We're we're doing what we're supposed to be doing, and that's that's reassuring to me. That's really reassuring when this keeps dragging on. Uh, I hope that we can slowly do things like mask up and 
wash hands a lot, keep some physical distance in there and find something resembling normal life again. And then we can start the next phase of this experiment of whether or not we can use what we learn to filter out that human activity. Mm -hmm. So we'll see how that goes. I'm also looking forward to one day in the future when travel is allowed again, um, the current Project Espresso research was supposed to involve in April a zero gravity flight where we mm -hmm. got on the like a smaller version of the vomit comet mm -hmm. and we we're going to load a vacuum chamber onto it so we have a, a no gravity or a microgravity low atmosphere environment and I have a sandbox to put in there and I was going to create artificial landslides that were going to be my like sandbox landslide equivalents of asteroid landslides and i'm really really looking forward to doing that research once it's safe to to travel and to make that flight right and when you do that come back and we'll do another uh, seti live and we'll we'll look at zero gravity oh, landslides uh, there'll be but some maybe not your face photos it'll be not rather me. sort of green i don't know it's a <laughs> yes we'll do videos with that one as well because you know i'm going to be just uh, massively excited about ha what happens when these like these rocks that have aren't they've never dealt with trees and water and all of these things that weather and break them yet they still break and fall. Mm -hmm. um, I'm really, I'm really curious about a lot of things. I have some cool models and I want to know whether or not they're right. <laughs> so I need some more data for that. Great. We we'll look forward to that. Um, thank you so much. Thank you to everybody who uh, listened in today and, or watched in. Um, you can find out more, as I say, from the SETI Institute website. There'll be some links to take you to explore uh, these ideas more. And um, uh, Mika, we'll, we'll have another talk soon when you've done your zero gravity flight. Thank you very much. Okay. Take care. Goodbye, everyone.